far western edge of Europe lies a serene, tranquil, wild, willful and rugged island. An island of saints and scholars, an ancient place, rich in knowledge and yet still innocent. Its turbulent history has produced a spiritual people justly famed for their warmth, charm and gentle humor. They also share a passionate love for their homeland and, near or far, carry in their hearts its forty shades of green. Ireland represents the last European landfall before the massive Atlantic Ocean stretches 3,000 miles to North America. To the east lies its powerful neighbor, England. Throughout the centuries, the history of these two nations has been intertwined. 26 counties in the south form the Republic of Ireland, and six counties in the north are still a part of the United Kingdom. Ireland has a population of 5 million more than three and a half million in the south and nearly one and a half million in the north. Both Dublin, the capital of the Republic, and Belfast, the capital of Northern Ireland, lie on the east coast. The sea has played a vital role in the story of Ireland. It brought Viking invaders from Northern Europe in the 9th century, Anglo-Normans from England in the 12th century, and waves of English and Scottish settlers in the 17th century to displace the native population. There is evidence that men lived on this island as far back as 6000 BC. Some of the most dramatic remains of these early peoples are to be found in the Boyne Valley to the northwest of Dublin. A series of ancient passage tombs, such as these at Nauf, have been excavated in the area. The tomb at Newgrange is one of the oldest man-made structures in the world. It was built more than 3,000 years before the birth of Christ, and is older than some of the Egyptian pyramids. A stone passage runs into the heart of the mound, and an ingenious roof box over the door allows the sun to shine into the passageway just once a year during the winter solstice. Little is known of the history of these early peoples, but there are stories. In Ireland there are always stories. They are said to have practiced magic, and when invaders came to oust them, they used their art to survive as fairy people underground. The little people are still living in Ireland today, so they say, but they're quick and cunning and very elusive. The invaders were the Celts, a wandering warlike artistic people who had undertaken the arduous journey from Central Europe. The modern population are their descendants and their creative spirit and love of music survives to this day. Dublin is a modern, energetic city, but the old traditions are flourishing. Music and dance are part of the way of life in Ireland, and Dubliners know how to enjoy themselves. During Irish festivals, the city centre is sometimes closed to traffic. The pressures of 20th century life are temporarily suspended so that people can literally dance in the streets.
Dublin was founded by Viking invaders in the 9th century on the banks of the River Liffey. The river bisects the city, and there is some healthy rivalry between the Dubliners who live on the north side and those who live on the south. They are linked by a series of elegant bridges. The charming Hapenny Bridge was given its name because of the amount once charged to cross. During the 17th and 18th centuries, English influence became established in Ireland. The Custom House is one of the great architectural legacies from the era of Anglo-Irish rule. The elegant Georgian houses in Merrion Square also date from that period. During that era, Dublin became a cultural centre. The National Gallery of Ireland is still one of the finest galleries in Europe. More than 2,000 paintings are on display, including a comprehensive collection of works by Irish artists throughout the ages. An entire room is devoted to the paintings of Jack Butler Yeats, brother of the famous writer William Butler Yeats. In 1916, the Irish rose up against British rule. Ironically, the English Parliament had been on the point of giving Ireland some autonomy, but the Home Rule Bill was delayed by the outbreak of the First World War. Frustrated nationalists organised a rebellion centred in Dublin, known as the Easter Rising. A number of strategic buildings were occupied, and the Irish flag was raised for the first time over the General Post Office in O'Connell Street, the city's main thoroughfare. Many of the city landmarks are still strongly associated with the Rising. The Shelburne Hotel was the site for one of the first drafts of the Irish Constitution. The hotel overlooks St. Stephen's Green, the scene of military action during the rebellion. Today, it is a sanctuary from the bustle of the city streets. In the words of a popular ballad, Dublin can be heaven with coffee at eleven and a stroll in Stephen's Green. A short distance from the Green is one of the city's most fashionable shopping centres, Grafton Street, a popular haunt for street artists and musicians. Dublin has produced some of the world's greatest writers and intellectuals, many of them educated at Trinity College. The college was founded in 1592 and is one of the oldest universities in Western Europe. It was extensively rebuilt in the 18th century, and most of the buildings in the main square date from that era. The university houses some of the country's most precious historic treasures including the 9th century Book of Kells. And a harp, alleged to have belonged to Brian Beru, Ireland's greatest king. Some of the library's most valuable works of literature are kept in the impressive long room. In 1600, the library contained 30 books and 10 manuscripts. It now houses 2 million printed books and some 5,000 manuscripts. Lining the room are busts of great men of learning, 
including some who studied at Trinity, such as the 18th century author of Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift. Swift went on to become Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral and is fondly remembered by one of his successors, Dean Griffith. He could do almost anything with the Irish people, and he, uh, on one occasion, I believe, was rather disturbed in the deanery because a great concourse gathered in the deanery yard, and Swift sent out his servant to see what's going on, and a great lot of noise outside in the yard. And the um, servant came back and said, they've come here to view an eclipse of the sun, and they're going to get it from a better vantage point in the deanery yard. The dean, who didn't wish to be disturbed, said, go out and tell them I've postponed it for 24 hours. So he went out and told the assembled multitude, the dean has postponed the eclipse of the sun for 24 hours. And they all went home quite happy and contented, coming back in 24 hours to view the eclipse of the sun, which had been postponed by order of Swift, the dean of St. Patrick's. was built in the 12th century on the site where St. Patrick is said to have baptized converts in the year 450 AD. According to local legend, the patron saint of Ireland struck the ground with his staff and water gushed forth from the earth. Since that day, the site has been a place of worship. St. Patrick's was extensively restored in the 19th century using funds provided by Guinness, the country's most famous family. The Guinness Empire began in 1759 when Arthur Guinness, then aged 34, paid a hundred pounds down on a 9,000 year lease of a brewery at St. James Gate. By the beginning of the 20th century, the brewery had become the largest in the world and was almost a city within a city. A quarter of a million barrels were once stacked in the cooperage yard, each one of them made by hand. Today, more modern methods are used to brew and store the beer. The ingredients remain the same, malt, barley, hops and water. But they are now boiled in space-age giant kettles. The brew house is designed to produce two and a half million pints a day. And there is no shortage of warm, friendly establishments happy to serve a glass of the national drink and toast your health. The toasts are as Irish as the beer. May the roof above us never fall in and the friends beneath it never fall out. Or may you be in heaven for half an hour before the devil knows you're dead. The Irish love to talk and enjoy music. The Dublin pubs are bursting with life and atmosphere. Many ancient folk instruments are used today by Irish musicians, but the queen of them all, and the one adopted as Ireland's national symbol, is a harp. Kalmar Macha still carves the beautiful instruments by hand at the Marley Park Craft Centre on the south side of the city. What I'm doing at the moment is I'm just scraping off all the rough edges. Some people use sandpaper. I just find this is better for getting a shape. But it also puts a nice finish on the curves. This is actually 
the sound box. Now, it's a very important part of the harp because the pillar and curve, which is the piece I've been working on in device, that, if you like, supports the strings and all the hardware. And the sound is obviously generated by plucking the string, but the sound is actually amplified by this particular box here. skill, care and patience are rewarded when the harp is finally ready. Although he can play himself, he prefers to enlist the help of an expert, Arnie Nigul, to give life to his creation. is not confined only to words and music. They also handed down to their descendants the fastest field team game in the world. Hurling takes its name from the crooked stick carved from ash that is used to control the ball. The clash of the ash, as it is known in Ireland, is not a game for the faint heart. Since prehistoric times, and ancient sagas tell of matches between warriors that went on for days. Dublin is surrounded by the rural East Midlands, the counties of Longford, Louth, Meath, Westmeath, Kildare, Leash, and Wicklow. The wild, gentle beauty of the Wicklow Mountains can be experienced just a few miles south of the capital. The region is sparsely populated, the pace of life slow. Ice Age glaciers long ago rounded the granite hills into their soft curves, and centuries of farming have painted them green and gold. The glaciers carve deep, dark glens in the valley floor, and such a place was chosen for a monastic settlement by one of Ireland's great saints. Dendeloch lies in the heart of the mountains in a secluded valley. St. Kevin is said to have discovered this beautiful retreat in the middle of the 6th century. Castletown House, in nearby County Kildare, is the largest Palladian mansion in Ireland. Unlike many of the other great country houses, it was built for a native-born Irishman of humble origins, 
William Connolly. He was a lawyer from Donegal who made an enormous fortune in land transactions. By the 1720s, he'd become the wealthiest man in Ireland. The house was furnished by Lady Louisa Connolly in the latter part of the 18th century. She was responsible for the Pompeian style of the long gallery used by the family as a living room. She also created the charming print room. During the 18th century, it was fashionable for ladies to cut out favorite prints to decorate screens or walls. Ireland's love affair with a horse has at its heart the curra in County Kildare. This is the course in which the Irish Derby, St. Ledger and Guineas are run. For many people, it is also a grand way to enjoy an afternoon, especially if luck is with them. Right, Second race is on here. On Derby Day, racecores spend more than a million pounds with the bookies and more than 400,000 at the tote. extends over 4,000 acres and includes the stables of nearly 60 trailers. Every morning, six days a week, the horses are taken out for a run. John Ox is one of the top trainers in Ireland and has won the St. Ledger twice love of horses runs in the family. John took off the stables from his father. Since then, he has achieved great success and usually has more than 80 winners a year. The nearby national stud has produced some of the greatest and most expensive horses in history. The cost of a stallion can run into seven figures. of the southeast comprise Carlow, Tipperary, Kilkenny, Wexford, and Waterford. Sandy beaches and rolling farmland characterize the southern coastline in County Waterford. The ruins of probably the oldest Christian settlement in Ireland rise above the beach at Ardmore. The site was established at the beginning of the Middle Ages by St. Declan. He is said to have arrived here and preached Christianity even before St. Patrick began his mission further north. The unusual stone carvings on the cathedral wall were fashioned about a thousand years ago. The 97-foot round tower is one of the most perfect in the country. They were used to store valuables and as watchtowers to warn of a Viking attack. In cases of extreme necessity, the monks would take refuge inside. The city of Watford was a Viking stronghold for many centuries. Today, it is a lively port and the economic mainstay of the southeast. <laughs> Thank you. 
The name Waterford has become associated throughout the world with the city's famous crystal. opened in 1783, a few miles from the modern site. Cutting is a skill that takes years of rigorous training to perfect. Each incision must be exactly the right depth. Too deep, and a piece that has taken weeks of patient work will have to be discarded. A reward for the centuries of knowledge, years of training, and weeks of skilled effort is simply the beauty of shimmering light. above the Tipperary Plains is the most dramatic man-made site in Ireland. The seat of the ancient high kings of Munster, the rock is a magnificent complex of proud and lofty ruins. was once ruled by hundreds of warring kings. They, in turn, were governed from Cashel by the High Kings. St. Patrick arrived at Cashel in the 5th century and wasted no time in converting the king. In the course of the baptismal ceremony, St. Patrick inadvertently drove his staff through the monarch's foot. Assuming the pain to be part of the ritual, the king bore it without complaint. A partnership between church and state was formed. The famous southwest, Cork and Kerry, includes some of Ireland's most spectacular scenery. The Ring of Kerry winds for 110 miles along the coast of the Iberia Peninsula through some of Europe's most breathtaking vistas. Long strips of golden sand curve towards the moody ocean like shimmering necklaces. Cuddy's Reeks, Ireland's highest mountains, stretch proudly towards the sky, while below, salmon and trout crowd the crystal waters of the mountain streams. To the north, the wild and rugged Dingle Peninsula juts defiantly towards the Atlantic. This part of Ireland is one of the most untouched by the rigours of the modern world. The lush green pastures rise out of the mist like a land that time has forgotten.
This part of Kerry is rich in historical remains. Snaking across the cliffs, there are over 400 of these mortalist stone dwellings known as beehive huts. Many date from the pre-Christian era. The Galerus Oratory is one of the most perfect examples of early Irish building in the country and is thought to date from the 8th century. Dingle is a warm and very Irish place. One of the few remaining outposts where the native tongue is spoken as a first language. Although the language has been eroded, Irish culture is thriving. Traditional dances are absorbed into a modern treatment of the Shiam Shatira Folk Theatre in Tralee, Kerizardis town. The Shiam Shatira is the national folk theatre of Ireland and uses music, dance and mime to bring to life the great rural artistic traditions. of Killarney have been an endless source of fascination and wonder for poets, artists and photographers. The beauty of the lakes is the essence of Kerry. Light playing on water, sudden rainbows, arching through the clouds. Ice Age glaciers melted some 10,000 years ago, but not before they had gouged out great valley floors and scattered huge rocks across the landscape, as legend has it, like giants throwing stones. The shores of Muckross Lake is a magnificent Victorian mansion built in the mid-19th century as a family home for Henry Arthur Herbert, later to become Member of Parliament for Kerry. The house is situated on a vast estate, now a national park, that includes acres of beautiful gardens and spacious grounds. The lively little town of Killarney is an historic tourist attraction. Its brightly painted shops and pubs wink invitingly at visitors who come from every corner of the globe to enjoy a little Irish hospitality. Killarney was a hamlet until the 18th century when a far-sighted local magnate, Lord Kilmare, thought there might be money to be made from tourism. He was right. Killarney is thriving but still succeeds in keeping its small-town Irish charm. Irish charm, otherwise known as the gift of the gab, can supposedly be acquired at Blarney Castle in County Cork. The 16th century owner of the castle was an expert at flattery and excuses. He was accused by Queen Elizabeth I are being full of blarney talk. The incident created a new word and a legend.
I can't go there. Kissing the Barney Stone is believed to impart an easy eloquence to all who are prepared to undergo the physical rigors of hanging upside down over the castle battlements. There is no shortage of prospective orators keen to acquire a silver tongue, but their newfound talent is not always obvious. The castle is just four miles north of Cork, the second largest city in the Irish Republic, and Dublin's friendliest rival. The name comes from a Gaelic word, Corking, meaning a marshy place. The city stands on what was originally marshland created by the River Lee. All the main streets and thoroughfares of modern Cork were once canals and waterways. In the 19th century, the city achieved great wealth, principally from the export of fresh local butter to the best tables in Europe. For the rural poor, however, the 19th century brought one of the greatest tragedies in Irish history. At that time, the peasants' staple diet was the potato. When the harvest failed, the poor starved. A potato blight in 1845 destroyed the crop and led to what is now known as the Great Famine. When it was over, a million people had died of starvation and more than a million had set off mainly for America in squalid, cramped ships. While crossing the Atlantic, they braved the most desperate conditions, hoping to find a better world across the sea. The island of today is a better world, and one of the best places to enjoy its lively, friendly character is Kinsale to the south of Cork paradise for yachtsmen and sea anglers. This picturesque town is also famous for its gourmet restaurants and pubs. Their names recall the town's rich and dramatic history. In 1601, the Irish and Spanish joined forces, but were defeated by the English. The Battle of Kinsale was a turning point in European history. The principal counties of the Shannon region are Clare, Limerick and Offaly. The area takes its name from the mighty river that snakes through the Midwest. The Shannon, in its many moods, is the lifeblood of the west of Ireland. The combined length of the river and its tributaries is well over a thousand miles. On a rise, Overlooking a broad bend of the Shannon and County Offaly are the ruins of one of the greatest monastic centres in Ireland. Clonmac Noise was founded by St. Kieran in the 6th century. At the height of its influence, it was one of the principal Christian seats of learning in Europe. Clonmac Noise is today a place of ethereal repose, where the voices of the past seem to whisper across the centuries. Much of the land in County Offaly is bulk. For the rural poor, the rich springy tough was a source of fuel for many centuries.
was cut into blocks and allowed to dry until it was ready to keep the home fires burning. It is still cut by hand in this way in the more remote parts of the country. The flat central plains of Offaly are a dramatic contrast to the towering majesty of the Clare coastline. The cliffs of Moor soar mightily above the pounding Atlantic, apparently indifferent to the ocean's great power. The 19th century lookout for Brian's Tower marks their highest point, nearly 700 feet above the water. The cliffs extend for some five miles and form one of the grandest and most breathtaking coastlines in Europe. a strange and lonely landscape known as the Burren. Stark grey limestone terraces snake across the landscape as if carved by some alien hand. Oliver Cromwell, who headed the English government in the 17th century and is famed for his brutal suppression of the Irish, gave a characteristic description of the Burren. Not enough wood to hang a man not enough water to drown him, and not enough clay to cover his corpse. County Clare has a rich musical tradition, and Goss O'Connor's in the little village of Doonan has acquired a reputation as a meeting point for session musicians from all parts of Ireland. Favourite instruments are the Ilian pipes, fiddle and tin whistle. It is common to find traditional music in pubs throughout Ireland, rousing folk tunes that express the Irish passion for the enjoyment of life. is a land of castles. There are more than 900 in the counties of Clare, Limerick and Galway. Some, such as Dromoland Castle, have been turned into luxury hotels. Others, like the 16th century Craganoan Castle, are a vehicle to display the richness of Irish history. The way ordinary people lived 1,000 years ago has been recreated at Craganoan. The Celtic community would have herded cattle, grown grain, and hunted for food. Here, in the shelter of their ring fort, the women cooked over open peat fires and dyed sheep's wool using natural color, such as elderberries. Bunratty is perhaps the most famous of all the castles in Ireland. This 15th century fortress lay ruined and derelict for hundreds of years until it was bought in 1954. The vast dining hall of the first floor 
is now a venue for nightly medieval banquets. Guests are transported back in time to the 15th century and are wined and dined in lavish style. They are also treated to the warmth of Irish hospitality. The wit of Irish storytelling. Yet we are the movers and shapers of the world forever it seems. And the purity of Irish melody. counties of Mayo, Roscommon and Galway. Connemara is a heartland of the Irish-speaking areas known as the Gaelthort, and one of the most wild and rugged regions in Ireland. The forlorn and desolate beauty of Connemara is balm to the soul for those seeking to escape the crowds and pressure of modern life. Many hundreds of years, however, the magnificence of the scenery was lost on the men and women who scraped a meagre living from the barren, stony soil. Today, vast lonely lakes, wild moorland, and brooding mountains are a haven for nature lovers and a paradise for fishermen. Beneath the lake's glistening water, salmon and trout are fighting for a bit of space. In past centuries, the people in this part of Ireland depended on a unique style of boat, known as the hooker, for the transportation of peat and livestock. There are no working boats left, but a restoration program has saved these unusual vessels from extinction. They are being rebuilt by local people keen to preserve their heritage, such as Jim Hawk. This boat is uh, about 100 years old. It would, was used in Connemara as a car would be used today, a family car. Connemara had little or no roads, and there were hundreds of islands, so the boat was really a lifeline. Every family had to have one. During the summer, the distinctive sails can be seen again in the waters off the Connemara coast as the boats compete in the annual hooker races. Only Gaelic is spoken on board. It is an opportunity for the older members of the community to pass on knowledge and traditions and for the young to learn.
Galway city began as a small fishing village and by the 13th century had become a walled town that traded extensively with Spain. The Spanish arch is all that remains of the walls. The Clara fishing village, once a self-contained community with an elected mayor, no longer exists and has been absorbed into the suburbs of the city. The name, however, has survived. The distinctive Clara Ring design has become known throughout the world as a symbol of peace and friendship. The rings are still made by hand today at Fallas Jewelers in the center of the city. The method is believed to have been first used by a Galway goldsmith who acquired his skills in North Africa after being captured by pirates. The area is renowned for its fresh seafood, and that is excuse enough, as far as the Irish are concerned, to hold a huge party every year. It's known as the Galway Oyster Festival. It's an international festival. That means anyone, whatever their nationality, can come to the party if they wish. The key event is the oyster opening competition, an opportunity for the world's most skilled wheelers of the small knife to pit their wits against each other. The rules are tough. Marks are deducted if even a drop of the contestant's blood is found in the oyster. Spinner now, what to do? The main point of all this is known in Ireland as crack, meaning fun, having a good time letting your hair down. Ask any Irishman what he thinks of the Oyster Festival, and he'll tell you, it's great crack. worries of everyday life and simply laugh, sing and dance is a skill that the Irish have bastard and are happy to share. Across Galway Bay by the ancient islands of Arran, home to many early Christian and pre-Christian remains. The Doom Angus Fort on Inish Moor is one of Europe's most dramatic prehistoric monuments. Perched on a 200-foot sheer cliff, it consists of four semicircular defensive walls surrounded by thousands of upright limestone pillars. No one knows when it was built or why, but it is believed to be at least 3,000 years old. Arran is geologically an extension of the barren limestone rock of the Burren and County Clare. Over the centuries, the islanders have literally manufactured the soil out of sand and seaweed to grow meagre crops for livestock. 
Like Connemara, there is no shortage of stones. The people have left their signature on the landscape, a complex labyrinth of winding stone walls. Fishing is the main industry, and traditional boats known as curraghs are still commonly used. The canoe-style boats are made of tarred canvas stretched over wooden frames. They have been used on these islands for centuries, and can cut through the water with impressive speed. The often harsh weather conditions endured by the fishermen gave rise to the need for warm clothing. What better than the Aran sweater, now famous throughout the world? Mary Flaherty is one of the most skilled knitters on the islands. Knitting has been in my family for three generations, at least. I used to watch my grandmother knit as a child, and that's where I picked up most of my passions. Those passions were used in sweaters and socks and worn by the local fishermen. When there was somebody lost at sea or a body washed ashore, the sweater or the socks were sent to the parish priest and that's how bodies were identified. The isolated position of the islands has preserved a traditional way of life. Christian monastic movements began here, and the links with the past are still strong. One of the most important modern religious sites in Ireland is the village of Knock in County Mayo. It was here in 1879 that a number of local people saw a vision of the Blessed Virgin, St. Joseph, and St. John the Baptist appear on the south gable of the church. In 1976, a huge basilica was opened, capable of holding 15,000 people. The shrine now receives one and a half million visitors a year, many of them invalids, who have heard reports of miraculous cures. In the northwest of the Republic are the counties of Leitrim, Monaghan, Cavan, Donegal, and Sligo. The Sligo landscape is one of stark and striking drama. This is Yeats' country. The poet William Butler Yeats and his artist brother, Jack, immortalize this land in the printed word and on campus. The poet lies buried in Drumcliff Churchyard beneath Ben Balbin, one of Sligo's most spectacular mountains. Before he died, Yeats wrote a poem about his own burial place. Under bare Ben Bulban's head, in Drumcliff Churchyard, Yeats is laid. An ancestor was rector there long years ago. A church stands near. By the road, an ancient cross. No marble, no conventional phrase. On limestone, quarried near the spot, by his command, these words are cut. Cast a cold eye on life, on death. Horseman, pass by. County Donegal possesses some of the most beautiful and varied scenery in Ireland.
exposed to the full force of the Atlantic on three sides, the coastline is wild and rugged. Malin Head is the most northerly point in Ireland, though it is politically part of the south. The way of life here is rural. There are no cities or large towns. One of the main sources of income is the manufacture of high-quality tweed. The people are especially friendly. Irish is still spoken, and the old ways survive. Donegal was deeply affected by the Great Famine in the 1840s. Many people died or emigrated, and the population has not yet recovered. The six counties of Northern Ireland are Antrim, Down, Armagh, Derry, Tyrone and Fermanagh. They remained part of the United Kingdom in 1922, and the Irish Free State was established. The little town of Pettigo was literally split down the middle. Border follows the river through the centre of the town. They say it's full of bilingual fish. On the Donegal side, there's a statue commemorating the deaths of four Irish nationalists in 1922. And on the Fermanagh side, an oak tree commemorates a British victory during the Crimean War. The friction in Northern Ireland between the Protestant majority and the Catholic minority has resulted in some communal strife. Though this problem remains unresolved, the negative images are largely dispelled by the overwhelming warmth and hospitality of the people and the great natural beauty of the region. Fermanagh's Lakeland is one of the most spectacular beauty spots in Europe. One third of the county is underwater, and the center is almost entirely covered by the vast waters of Loch Erne. Lakeland region are some of the finest limestone caves in Europe. The marble arch caves are a fantastic wonder of glistening stalactites and mysterious bubbling rock formations. This fascinating magical world has been created by the flow of acid water on limestone over a period of more than 300 million years. The city of Armagh was the seat of the Ulster kings for some six centuries. Today, it is home to the Irish leaders of both the Protestant Church of Ireland and the Roman Catholic Church. The lavish Roman Catholic Cathedral was built in the 19th century and took 60 years to complete. The Church of Ireland Cathedral also dates mainly from the 19th century. The site, however, is ancient, and there has been a church on this hill since 445 AD, when St. Patrick built his main cathedral here.
drivers in County Armagh should be wary, as they may encounter the ancient game of road bowls. The game is known locally as the bullets. Some say it began with the use of cannonballs. The players compete to hurl a metal ball along a set course in the fewest possible throws. Spectators bet on the outcome of the game and sometimes on an individual throw. Players have a handler who stands with his legs astride to show the best line. The skill lies in negotiating the bends in the road, either by throwing the ball over the corner or curving the throw. The game is now played only in Armagh and Cork. The city of Derry, also known as London Derry, is situated on the River Foyle, surrounded by a rolling countryside. The city's growth in the 17th century was financed by the wealthy trade guilds of London, and it was during this time that the prefix was added to its name. In 1614, the guilds created the last walled city in Europe. The 20-foot walls complete with cannons can still be seen today. The most famous siege took place in 1689 when local Protestant apprentice boys shut the gates against the Catholic forces of James II. More than 7,000 people died of starvation or disease in the subsequent blockade. The magnificent north coast of Derry its long golden beaches was a site chosen in the 18th century by the Bishop of Derry for his landscaped estate. The remarkable Mussenden Temple, perched dramatically on the cliff top, was built as a library. Legend says the giant Finn McCool built this massive staircase towards the sea so that he could visit his beloved in Scotland without getting his feet wet. Giant's Causeway. One of the wonders of the natural world is the most startling sight along the Antrim coast. Some 37,000 geometric basalt columns march in unison towards the ocean. Similar columns do in fact emerge on the other side of the sea in Scotland giving credence to the story. For the more scientifically minded, the causeway was the result of volcanic lava cooling some 60 million years ago. Further along the coast, clinging defiantly to a rocky headland above sheer plunging cliffs, is Dunluce Castle. This dramatic ruin was once the stronghold of the fiery MacDonald, the Earls of Antrim. On a stormy night in 1639, the servants were busy preparing dinner when part of the cliff collapsed, taking with it the kitchens and several members of the household. The castle somehow expresses the spirit of the Irish, fearless, determined, wild and romantic. A few miles from Dunluce, is the world's oldest distillery, Bushmills, in operation since 1608. The malt whiskey is made from barley and local water. The spirit is left to mature for up to 12 years on these oak casks. There are 7,000 of them, each holding 50 gallons. The smell of alcohol they emit is staggering, 
and is known at the distillery as the Angel's Share. It's probably a good idea to keep the Bushmills tasting session down to a minimum before negotiating the rope bridge at nearby Carricka Reed. The fragile bridge sways across a 60-foot chasm above an 80-foot drop into the sea below. It is put up by local fishermen every spring to give them access to the rich haul of salmon and the waters on the other side. Those who have the courage to endure the crossing are rewarded with beautiful views along the Antrim coast. One of the highlights of the year for the people of Antrim is the Owl Lamas Fair held each August at Bally Castle on the northern coast. The fair combines business with pleasure. Farmers take the opportunity to trade their horses and ponies. Local delicacies on sale and do dulse, a dried edible seaweed, and yellow man, sweet, sticky slabs of candy. The exact origin of the fair is uncertain, but it is one of the oldest in Ireland, dating back to the early part of the 17th century. The celebrated nine glens of Antrim have inspired poetry, prose and legends that have spread word of their beauty throughout the world. The queen of them all is Glen Arif, a vast sweeping valley carved out in the Ice Age. On the valley floor, giant waterfalls pound precipitous rock faces, plunging into the swirling peaty water below. Their Celtic names have survived through the centuries. This is Es Nalarach, meaning the fall of the mare. The poetic description is an indication that the ancient inhabitants of Ireland were an artistic people and appreciated the beauty of their surroundings. In Glen Arif, that beauty remains unsullied by time or people. Frankford Lock in County Down was given its name by invading Norsemen. It means violent form. There is little evidence of the violence today. Its sheltered harbours in many islands make it ideal for sailing and deep sea fishing. At the mouth of the lock is Castle Ward a unique 18th century house set in a 700 acre estate. The house is divided into two distinct styles, neoclassical at the front, and Gothic at the back. Bernard Ward, the first Viscount Bangor, could not agree with his wife, Anne, on the question of architectural taste. But the agreed compromise, if it can be called such, was to literally split the house in two. The Viscount's neoclassical taste is reflected in the interior design at the front of the house.
double doors and the velvet styles lead to the rooms of the whimsical Gothic style preferred by Lady Anne. The compromise apparently did not work, and Lady Anne eventually left her husband for good. East shore of Strangford Lock, along the Ards Peninsula, is Mount Stuart, the former home of the Marquesses of Londonderry. The fairy tale gardens were designed by Edith Lady Londonderry and include an array of styles from all parts of the globe. Farther away from the house, a spacious wooded park has a tranquil lake as its focal point. The mountains of Morn sweep down to the sea, and they really do. The mountains curve in a neat ring a short distance from the coast. The heather-clad hills are ideal walking country. A series of roads cross through the mountains could hardly be described as crowded. At the foot of the mountains in Newcastle is the Royal County Down Golf Club in a beautiful and remote setting beside the sea. The course is part of the sand dunes. Nature has thoughtfully provided the bunkers as if she suspected that one day men were bound to wield golf clubs. Belfast is one of the youngest capital cities in the world and has experienced some of the fastest growth in history. The Industrial Revolution of the 19th century brought an explosion in the city's wealth, and most of the lavish architecture dates from this era, including the dominating city hall and the elegant Queen's University. On the outskirts of the city are the magnificent parliament buildings at Stormont, set in 300 acres of fine grounds. Built at the beginning of the 20th century, the massive classical building was a gift from the British government and was opened by George V. Although there has been friction between the different communities in the city, the people are warm and friendly. Pubs are inviting, and Belfast is always ready to find an excuse for a celebration. Christmas is one of the best times to experience the atmosphere of the city.
carol services provide a good opportunity for the different communities to get together for a song or two. The differences are temporarily forgotten. People of all ages, both Protestant and Catholic, unite to enjoy the harmony of the season. place of heart-wrenching beauty, where mm -hmm. complex layers of time and history have left their indelible marks on the landscape and the people. Ireland, where the fiery Celtic spirit is expressed in poetry, music and dance. A unique island where the unexpected usually happens. A state of mind as much as a place. A country where life and laughter are never far away. And where there are no strangers, only future friends. 